we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Accelerate and Assure the Adoption of Cloud Data Platforms Using Intelligent Data Automation, sponsored today by Irwin. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Danny Sandwell. Danny is an IT industry veteran with more than 30 years of experience. As director and product marketing for Irwin, he is responsible for communicating the technical capabilities and business value of the company's data modeling and data intelligence solutions. During Danny's 20 plus years with the company, he also has worked in pre-sales consulting, product management, business development, and business strategy roles, all giving him opportunities to engage with customers across various industries as they plan, develop, and manage their data architectures. His goal is to help enterprises unlock the value of their data assets to produce the desired results while mitigating data related risks. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Danny to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hey, thank you, Shannon, and thank you everybody for taking the time to join us. Uh, every time I listen to that, uh, that bio, it all sounds very impressive, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm really just a data guy. And I have a feeling that a few of the people on this line might be data people as well. So uh, let's get started. Really, you know, what we're looking at here today is, is sort of a, a unique uh, capability that we've built up over time uh, based on the needs of, of our customer base um, and, and really uh, a very, very powerful capability in terms of, of allowing you the, the agility and the capability to move to uh, the platforms that are going to best serve your business moving forward. Uh, in these, what I think I'm fairly safe uh, to say are, are some very strange, challenging, unique, but uh, but in the same time, exciting times. So uh, with that, let's let's get started. So um, since this is sponsored by Irwin, and if you're not familiar with us as an organization, uh, just a quick look in terms of, of what we do and what we intend to bring to the market. Uh, what we've done is brought together a, a set of solutions uh, that, that give you all the capability and tool sets required uh, to really understand your enterprise, um, you know, at, at all levels of detail, um, you know, that starts with our Irwin Evolve Suite, which looks at um, enterprise architecture, uh, business process, and innovation management. Uh, really understanding, you know, what is the state of the enterprise today, both from a business and a technical perspective. Um, really looking at what are the goals um, and, and desires of your enterprise, the strategies to fulfill those, uh, and then be able to, to leverage that and put that into a, a clear view of the, uh, you know, the capabilities, technologies, infrastructures, and data that you have uh, to, to really plan, analyze, uh, uh, design a way forward and then manage that process uh, in a collaborative fashion with great visibility and understanding in terms of uh, where we are today, where we want to get to, um, uh, you know, and then who's responsible for what and where we are um, on that journey so that everybody can be uh, fully informed, set expectations appropriately and be prepared to leverage uh, transformation and innovation on day one. Uh, our flagship data modeling product, which is really what, uh, it, it, you know, it's our, our legacy, it's our pedigree, um, it, you know, the, the leader that we are uh, in delivering technology that allows you to uh, get the most out of uh, your data sources, uh, whether you're designing new ones, uh, integrating them, understanding what's in them, or, or trying to communicate to the larger organization uh, what data is available to them and, and, and uh, how they can access it. And then, um, you know, at our foundation now is our data intelligence suite, which is a combination of a catalog uh, as well as a data literacy suite that allows you to look at uh, all of your technical data assets, uh, you know, document those uh, in the form of metadata, uh, provide all of the insights around that, and then 
put a, uh, a, a strong governance and intelligence framework around that in the form of a, a business glossary manage, uh, manager, you know, some uh, AI and machine learning capabilities, uh, workflow, and a business user portal so that you can bring that context to your technical data assets. Uh, you can you can start to apply policy rules, all of those good things, uh, so that people know how to use the data, how not to use the data, what data is sensitive, uh, you know, what are the, the the sort of nuances around that data, and really become much more literate to become effective in delivering that. And through this capability, uh, and our da our data connectors, our standard data connectors, which are for you know all of the data sources that you have across uh, the organization, and then our smart data connectors, which will be a big focus of what we're talking about today, uh, is the ability to take that data catalog uh, and and business glossary and really activate all of the metadata that's in there and use that activation to automate uh, you know tasks that will, will again, allow you to do things uh, better, faster, cheaper, uh, with much less risk of missing the mark and, and, and uh, not delivering what the organization wants you to deliver when it comes to, to data across the organization. So that's what we do. Uh, and, and this, again, is, is something that we're seeing a lot of organizations very, very interested in uh, as they are taking that journey towards uh, being a data-driven enterprise um, because, you know, they understand that there's a lot of moving pieces there, uh, especially organizations that have uh, a, a legacy of data management uh, and are looking to take that and really provide that agility to the business that's required uh, with without the risks that come along with all that data can represent for an organization, uh, you know, in today's world. So, you know, the, the title, you know, uh, Assure and Accelerate, uh, the adoption of, of a cloud, uh, you know, data platform. Really, when you look at what I'm talking about here, it's specifically focused on uh, some of the great platforms that are out there uh, in terms of, of you know, cloud-hosted data capability. Uh, but if your modernization needs uh, don't include the cloud for whatever reason, if your organization's not ready to get there or that there's, uh, you know, barriers towards that adoption, if you're modernizing on-premise, um, all of this still applies and this capability and the value behind it uh, is, is going to be very, very useful for you. So whether you're, you know, moving from um, you know, from your on-premise out to something like a, a Snowflake or an Azure, uh, you know, data uh, data factory. Uh, this is very appropriate. But if you're taking some of your legacy capabilities and technologies and trying to modernize that in-house, um, same same value, same prop, uh, value proposition applies. So why are people moving towards the cloud or, or looking for data platform modernization? Well. It's not, it, you know, it's not a mystery. Uh, you know, digital transformation, uh, the ability to take uh, businesses that have been around for a long time uh, in a in a classic brick and mortar, you know, uh, in person type of of uh, business model, and find new ways uh, to market, uh, new ways to new customers. Uh, better ways to deliver uh, value and satisfaction to those customers, and really elevate uh, their ability to to uh, you know uh, compete in the markets that they choose to compete in. Uh, and a lot of this is through data driven innovation. So uh, going out and finding new ways to do things based on what the the data in your organization and around your organization is telling you in terms of informed insights versus you know. Um, uh, gut feelings or, or, or you know, or, or best guesses. Um, as we've seen this year, 2020, uh, a very interesting year uh, and a lot of different uh, levels. Uh, business continuity uh, has, you know, continues to be a, a big driver and, and becomes more of a driver as, as we look at the types of things that could potentially interrupt our business or, or put our business at risk and making sure that we're set up uh, to, to be successful, no matter what uh, the next thing may bring us. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, financial optimization, you know, not just cutting costs, but making the best use of the money that you have, the resources that you have, targeting them at things that are going to really drive value in the business as opposed to uh, keep the lights on and keep the, uh, you know, the hamsters running on the wheels in the back room. So these are all things that organizations, no matter what vertical they're in, uh, no matter what business they're in, whether it's private sector, public sector, everybody is facing these challenges. Everybody has these goals, and these things are driving them, again, to modernize uh, their data capability, whether that's doing it on a cloud or, or bringing in a better mousetrap in-house on-premise and, and really putting, you know, setting up the organization for success. So, you know, when we look at uh, what, what we're coining and a lot of people are coining the, the uh, data dilemma or the enterprise data dilemma, you know, uh, a lot of great research being done by uh, Stuart Bond uh, at IDC. Um, and, and so I thought I'd bring some of this up because, you know, we see this every day anecdotally uh, from, you know, customers and prospects that we're working with. Um, but this is, you know, this is really a, a good global view in terms of, you know, the sheer amount of data and the rate of growth, um, you know, in terms of, of data, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to stop. And I think that growth percentage is just going to continue to uh, accelerate as uh, organizations uh, and, you know, businesses innovate, you know, organizations that serve those businesses innovate uh, and, and data becomes, uh, you know, ubiquitous. It becomes much more available. Uh, different types of data that were never considered before are now being brought into the, the pot uh, to be mixed up into that, that stew for the business. And when we look at organizations, uh, this one is is pretty you know a powerful figure. Ninety five percent of organizations integrating up to six different types of data, uh, again across ten different types of technologies, uh, which is is you know is no mean feat. And then when you take that to the next level, not just being able to store that data, manage it, and make sure that it has integrity, but then. Uh, allowing people in the organization that consume that data uh, for business benefit uh, to become uh, better at using that and, and, and a better data citizen overall in the organization is no small task. Uh, and then, of course, 95 or 94 percent of organizations were starting uh, to integrate data across hybrid cloud environments with, you know, elements of on-prem. Uh, elements of different cloud uh, approaches and cloud uh, architectures, uh, which again, while, can so while it can solve a lot of problems, it can bring a, a lot more complexity in, especially for an organization that has a strong legacy and uh, a strong uh, foundation in data management uh, processes and infrastructure that already exist and need to move forward into this modern world. Uh, and data intelligence is really, you know, being being targeted as as the answer for a lot of the problems, and 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 we see that every single day. Um, you know, data intelligence is is really the ability to to increase your your capability, understanding, and control of the data that you have in your organization, with the goal of bringing together. Uh, folks that are in data management, uh, data development and operations, uh, you know, data governance, uh, and then the business community that's consuming data and bring them together on a, you know, on a single pane of glass that will tell them the truth that they can, can consume and, and develop trust in the data that they're using, uh, greater capability and, and uh, ability to use that data uh, for benefit. Um, and 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 really, you know, get you know, realize that dream that organizations have, which is to become a data-driven organization. So, you know, uh, we're, we're really seeing an impact at the sort of native data worker level uh, in terms of this this environment complexity and the lack of intelligence around that data, the time that they're spending, and and. We're seeing that 80-20 rule, which is shifting in the wrong direction to an 85-15, where they're spending, you know, that 85% of their time just trying to figure out what data they have, uh, what it means, is it fit for use, uh, and then how to use that to, to meet the need or, or the use case that they have in front of them. Um, 
and only 20% or 15% of the time uh, actually delivering insights and value to the business. That's a ratio that cannot stand uh, and, and really needs to be moving in the other direction. Uh, and then this last piece out, out of their survey was really, really telling to me, uh, which is, you know, on average, data workers, um, you know, are, are more often unsuccessful than successful in their tasks as they go around and do that. So not only are they spending an inordinate amount of time, uh, you know, doing the grunt work of, of, you know, just trying to figure this stuff out, uh, but they're still not actually getting it right, uh, which means now we're deploying defects into the enterprise, uh, which you know affects operations, but it also affects uh, the perception of your organization internally for the people that are using that data and potentially getting burned. Uh, and then, you know, depending on how your organization is configured, uh, you know, the visibility that that outsiders, customers, partners, those types of people, uh, and and how they see that that lack of success uh, is going to also you know impact your reputation uh, and and how they perceive you as a trusted partner uh, in the business. So these are pretty important things. They're they're very very impactful, uh, and they need, really really truly need a um, you know a solution that's going to help them you know avoid this and change some of those numbers so that you know, when they go forward, they will take a data-driven approach because they know that they can trust the data, that they're fluent enough in that data to be successful in what they're doing, and that it's going to have a positive, not a negative impact on the business uh, by taking that approach. So this you know, brings us to why folks are, are looking at you know, um, you know, platform modernization around their, their, their data. Um, you know, there's, you know, the sort of larger benefits that the cloud brings in terms of, you know, performance, scalability, uh, you know, that elastic model and uh, agility that they have where, you know, you always have enough, uh, you know, compute power and horsepower behind what you're doing. Uh, you don't have to recognize that, make huge plans and processes and projects behind uh, ensuring that you're ready for that. Uh, the cloud provider is taking that off of your back and really giving you those capabilities with the technologies and the, the process that they put in place with their cloud, uh, you know, giving you an opportunity to really see, uh, you know, a lower total cost of ownership. Uh, and a future proof environment that, that's not going to be, uh, you know, significantly adversely impacted by anything that comes along uh, in this world that we live in. And at the end of the day, it sets you up to truly have the opportunity to get more value from your data as an organization, uh, which is, is the end goal. Uh, and then when you look at, you know, the Azures, the Snowflakes, uh, AWS, and there's more of them out there, uh, you know, they're really bringing together not just a, a new environment with servers and, uh, you know, compute power and, and all of those things and a great cost model, but they're actually bringing together key capabilities, allowing you to, you know, centralize, simplify, um, uh, you know, a lot of the things that you do around data, whether it's, you know, a, a high performance data store that, that allows you to have those, you know, hybrid uh, modalities, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, agile. Oh, I just saw something come up. Google, absolutely. Google. Um, I'm, I'm funny. I always like to put three things on a slide, but Google uh, actually is is you know also offering a cloud data platform uh, type capabilities as well. I didn't mean there was a specific reason for leaving them out. Uh, and you know, you're seeing agile data integration built in, uh, and you know, integrated BI and analytics. When we look at uh, Microsoft and Azure, what they're doing with Synapse and the data factory. Uh, it's very, very powerful combinations. So now, again, uh, simplifying not just, you know, uh, from a business perspective, what technologies you have, what technologies you're paying for, uh, what technologies you need support for, but also putting it all into an environment. So the job of integrating that and tying it all together and making it work 
becomes, uh, you know, less complex because it's integrated out of the box. It's made to work together. Uh, now you just got to find the right capabilities on that platform uh, to set yourself up for success. So this is a big part of, of you know, transformation, innovation, um, and, and business continuity is really taking advantage of this ongoing uh, maturation of the cloud environments and this, you know, emergence of, of people that are focused in the cloud on delivering, uh, you know, not just a place to host an application, but a real uh, data centric capability that can be a game changer in an organization. So exciting times. And as always, when we have exciting times, because, you know, uh, I, I never try to go too far to one end to the other. We have to then say, but oops, there might be some hurdles or challenges uh, to realizing that. And, and the two that we're seeing from, from customers that are out there uh, and folks that we're dealing with uh, is, is twofold. So first, you know, uh, it's great if you're a, 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 an organization that does not have a, a uh, you know, robust legacy uh, in terms of data management. Uh, it's easy to go to the cloud um, and then start looking at what are we going to build so that we can deploy that out there. And that's not an easy job. And you still need tooling and, and capabilities to do that in an efficient, efficient and effective way. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, as you start to bring in the complexity of migrating things that are serving the business today and moving them to that uh, new platform, uh, it's a real challenge, and that challenge is, is twofold. First, the migration process, uh, you know, delivering the time to value that the business expects, making sure that you're moving things from one environment to the other in an accurate way where the integrity is maintained and, uh, you know, there's no loss in, in, in capability or, or uh, you know, uh, business continuity. And then, of course, cost containment because those are complex systems sitting in your house uh, that aren't always necessarily well documented. You know, that's where governance and, and intelligence comes from is the need to maintain it uh, in house. Now you're trying to take that and lift it and put it somewhere else into this new technology uh, without losing anything and while trying to gain the benefits of the new capabilities that drove you to that platform in the first place. Then the next one, and this one is, is as important, if not more important, because you know a, a migration project is is you know not necessarily a one-time thing. You might be doing that in a staged fashion, uh, bringing things over, but you know that the impact of that is to a certain extent time boxed or time bound. Um, data governance and intelligence, nothing changes just because it's out in the cloud doesn't mean that your data is uh, any less valuable or any less vulnerable. So, uh, you know, providing transparency, uh, you know, and, and visibility, uh, you know, through that migration and, you know, process, making sure things are traceable uh, back to the way that they used to be uh, is very important. And then documenting these cutting edge technologies uh, and then potentially integrating that, that documentation and that knowledge base around that with other technologies that may be still sitting on prem. Um, uh, uh, and then taking that whole ball of wax and starting to democratize that out to all of the people that, you know, that might care. You know, there's other interesting numbers out there around, um, you know, data literacy in organizations. Gartner just put out a, a very good, uh, uh, you know, report that had some exciting numbers in there. Uh, where they're really looking at codifying data literacy programs in their organizations. One of the biggest challenges they have there is the foundation or the facility that will enable those literacy programs to be successful. Uh, and it's not just the data scientist or the data architect or the business analyst. It's everyone in the organization being able to have a common language and being able to, to uh, you know, uh, really, you know, leverage that language for for uh, success. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, somebody in in you know in in management knowing where their data comes from at a system level, uh, or you know somebody who's a data architect knowing the details of how data changes from one place to another uh, as it goes on that journey through the organization. 
uh, all of those questions need to be answered and organizations are seeing that as again another key enabler out there so these are two huge challenges uh, so you know getting things over to this new platform is tough enough uh, making sure that you understand how it got there and can actually, you know, prove that and show that to people and show them what they have in this new platform so that they can make the most of it is is a, a major, you know, uh, risk to that time to value proposition. So, you know, when we look at modernizing the data architecture and using automation, specifically, you know, um, metadata activation or taking a metadata driven approach, which is how we do things, uh, there's some key areas there that can really, you know, uh, bring you, uh, uh, you know, closer to realizing the time to value, ensuring a lot of accuracy, uh, reduce the manual touch and the cost behind that and have governance through that process and in place uh, so that it's governed on day one as you deploy this out to the business. So uh, what we're going to look at is, is, you know, first off, transforming and deploying a schema to these new, um, you know, these new data uh, management platforms. Uh, you know, you have a lot of different technologies that might be out there, a lot of databases, uh, you know, and you moving it to this because they have a, 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 a you know high performance database capability uh, the ability to bring in different formats and store them uh, in one environment as opposed to having specialty databases for this job or this format specialty databases for that um, then you've got to move that data right and make sure that the data comes across from the legacy system into the new system uh, and is ready to go with all of the integrity that's required uh, you, if you're going to maintain the data movement type of technologies that you have today, you have to at the very least repoint them uh, to this new environment and make sure uh, that, again, you're not losing something on the ongoing, uh, you know, loading and maintenance of that. Uh, but in a lot of cases, because of the nature of these new platforms and the nature of the need in business, you re need to actually re-platform all of that data movement logic and processes uh, to take advantage of new technologies and new capabilities that they offer. And then from that, you know, um, you know, making sure that you have a, a repeatable uh, automated, you know, DevOps process so that, you know, sure, it's great to get things to this new environment, but if you cannot change that environment and meet the next business requirement, um, you know, with the speed and agility that's required, then again, you're, you're still no farther ahead to, to realizing that time to value and that increased value from data that organizations are looking for. So let's take a, you know, a few steps here. Uh, first off, modernizing the data architecture, migrating those da database structures uh, to the cloud. And, and you know, one of the best ways to do that is using a data model. Um, and the reason behind that is, again, it takes a lot of the manual work out of it. There's a lot of automation involved in data modeling, the ability to reverse engineer and read that metadata and create a useful and usable graphical model to start work working with. Uh, technologies, data modeling technologies have a transformation capability to allow you, because you know our tool and, and, and a lot of the tools out there, uh, will support multiple databases and multiple database types using the same technology we surely do uh, so that you can then retarget those things and leverage the technology to transform, you know, tables, columns, uh, you know, constraints, uh, you know, uh, data types, um, you know, naming standards, all of those things uh, to make sure that's done quickly and effectively uh, without having to have somebody go in and basically recreate the wheel. And then, of course, the ability to forward engineer out of those technologies and deploy, uh, you know, that new schema uh, with, you know, all of the things transformed that are required uh, is very, very powerful. And on top of that, uh, you know, you're starting to, to create a, a, a very, you know, useful, uh, you know, logical model on top of that. So if you don't have models for your databases, now you can start to bi build in all that business context and start to do some of the grunt work that's required for governance intelligence, things like classifying your data. You know, uh, the data modeling tools support a very robust process of, 
of you know interrogating and discovering things about your data and documenting them as part of the overall uh, design and deployment. So, you know, strong capability to quickly take a structure and repoint it to a new technology uh, and leverage that. You know, maintaining all the consistency that's required, uh, but getting that done very quickly, uh, and then you know, the ability to then use those models to start working on other aspects of the project as you move forward. So big, big, big first step is getting those structures moved across, uh, you know, so whether you're taking a legacy, uh, you know, data warehouse or, or maybe a, a data lake that you've put out into, you know, one environment and tried to uh, implement, you know, on-premise and now you want to take advantage of the cloud to do those things. Uh, a data modeling uh, approach is going to get you there faster uh, with a high degree of, uh, of integrity through that transformation process. Now I need to, to just sort of give, provide a concept here as we start to move uh, you know, forward uh, into the other aspects of it. And it's this concept of, of data mapping or data document or data mapping documents. Now, you know, most organizations are doing mappings at some uh, level, uh, but what we're finding is most of them are not using uh, technologies to do data mappings that provide them all the utility that they need to be very, very successful. Um, you know, so really data mapping and capturing data mapping, and I, I look at them as the logical model for data movement in your organization or logical models. Um, you know, this is where you're really going to be able to capture that metadata, but have it in an environment where you can actually ap activate that metadata for maximum utility. So, you know, you can capture data movement, um, you know, uh, with our connectors, you can scan and auto document the code. So, you know, the majority of, of ETL or procedural code or, or, you know, newer big data scripting code type uh, environments, they have XML. Um, that they produce and, you know, we scan and, and auto document that um, and, and bring that into a mapping environment. It's very, very powerful and has a great amount of utility where you can abstract from any given technology and keep the essence of source transformation and target. And then push that forward, uh, whether it's transforming it and using a, another smart connector to target it at, uh, you know, Snowflake or Azure or Talend or whatever that, you know, new technology for data movement or, or taking, you know, uh, stored procedures and any other procedural code that you have in your database systems today and moving them into, uh, you know, that new data environment. Uh, you can do all of that in an automated fashion using these mapping documents, but then those mapping documents go far beyond just, you know, switching and, and generating code in a new environment. They also become the foundation to, uh, you know, discover and render your lineage, because really this is a true document of how data physically moves through your organization, which is what lineage represents, right? So forward and reverse lineage at a great level of detail and understanding that, but without having to actually go down and go back and figure out lineage for all of this data, it's there to be queried because it exists in these logical mapping documents. Uh, and then of course, impact analysis, where are these things used? Who's using them? What is it using, being used for? Uh, a, a huge foundation for establishing the value of data in your organization. So, <clears throat> you know, and you want those mapping, oh, I'm just missing the button here. There we go. Um, and, and as I said, you know, those mappings, they exist in spreadsheets. Um, you know, they may exist in a lot of different places, but uh, those places don't provide the utility. So you really want that into an environment that allows you to, again, leverage a graphical approach, a drag and drop approach, and brings intelligence into the mapping to accelerate that work. So, you know, mappings are great when you auto document them. That's what it looked like in the past, but those things are going to change. So you want to really bring those mappings into an environment uh, that is fully capable, has you know life cycle control over it so that you can really start managing that mapping process and you know making sure people understand what are the mappings that are in progress, which are the ones that are published, 
uh, you know, what replaced the other one, be able to see the, the, you know, traceability through that entire process as your data platform changes over time with new business requirements. So very important piece of, of this is making sure that you get that documented into an environment that has a, a large amount of utility. Um, you know, in that, oh, sorry, there, in there, you can then quickly bring in those models, uh, you know, uh, or, or if you've deployed the databases that you've transformed using the modeling technology, you bring that into this environment uh, and you use the automation in this mapping environment to automate the direct load of, you know, old data into new data. So these are fairly simple mappings uh, in terms of source and target not a lot of transformation in there, maybe some to deal with anomalies between the different platforms, uh, but quickly being able to establish mapping from your as-is system to your 2B system, uh, and then generate that using a smart connector into code uh, to build and automate the job of bulk loading your data from one uh, environment to the next. Uh, also, that would be the environment that you would also repoint. And again, automation in that environment will allow you to see if source or target has changed and it will make the changes to your mappings and allow you to bless those and publish those new mappings. So now you've also taken care of simple repointing of uh, ETL or data movement uh, if you're staying with the same technologies that you have today. But now we get to the one that's a, a little bit more of a, a a beast to tackle, which is really, you know, uh, automating that conversion of ETL uh, processes and logic and moving to these new technologies. So you're not just going to change the data source and repoint your existing data movement to that. You're actually going to lift what you have in terms of data movement uh, processes and redeploy them on a new technology. Uh, this is a real, uh, you know, uh, time and, and cost, uh, you know, uh, black hole, if we, <laughs> if you will, uh, you know, or money pit, and let's call it the money pit, because it's just so complex, and generally these types of processes are not very uh, transparent in terms of easy to understand uh, and easy to, to understand how they move from one to the other. So um, we've established a very strong, strong process that starts with a, a you know, automated ETL migration complexity assessment. Sounds like a lot, but really what it is, is it under, it's, it's about understanding what you have today uh, and then understanding and categorizing and analyzing those things uh, so that you can really understand what's in them and, and how complex they are. Uh, but also through that process, understanding the commonalities and the disconnects between the different platforms that you have, uh, it also becomes a great tool to feed your business case uh, and put your cost justifications into uh, that to drive forward to get the support that you need from the business to do this. Um, and then from there, again, it's, it's auto-documenting, reverse engineering the legacy ETL uh, technology, reading the code, bringing it into those mappings, using the smart connectors to point those to the new technology, uh, and then, you know, obviously testing that uh, at a unit test. And you'll see as we go through, this, you know, uh, this is sort of a sample of, of some of the uh, artifacts that we create through this assessment. Right, so first there's, uh, you know, a complexity uh, distribution. So, you know, there's some very simple things that are, you know, uh, take it from here, you know, uh, you know, concatenate it or something, or, or maybe, you know, cut off a few, uh, uh, you know, a few bytes at the end of it and put it over there. Uh, very simple. Uh, you know, moderate may have some levels of, um, uh, you know, moderate may have some levels of transformation, but again, fairly simple. Then you start to get into the complex and very complex. So now you have a clear understanding of what you have uh, in in terms of data movement processes and, and, uh, and jobs out there, and really can understand the distribution of them uh, and understand what is the task in front of us. Then we start to look at low design patterns and looking at commonalities behind, between them, because as we go forward and, and configure these smart connector, connectors to automate your job, 
Uh, the real value in that automation is the number of jobs that you can, uh, you know, get done with a repeatable process, not having to do something specific for each. So we'll do a deep analysis in terms of what you have, uh, the patterns behind them, and how we can uh, automate and, and transform those uh, in bulk. And then it'll you know, also show you what are some of the ones that um, you know, are just not worth taking the time to automate. Uh, they're very unique, uh, but there's very few of them. Uh, maybe those are the ones that you, you, know, you, you put your, your resources on to actually go through and do that job. And, you know, that's a sliding scale, and that becomes part of the, the you know, decision-making process in terms of potential cost savings, risks, and all the rest of that. Uh, and then frequency of those components, you know, in terms of how much reuse we can get through the automation process. Also, you know, what components you have, and then, you know, if you look down in the bottom left there, you know, it, this is, is moving from one environment to, uh, you know, as your data factory. Um, now we're seeing that there's no equivalent uh, in ADF in terms of out-of-the-box uh, transformations, so these are going to have to be custom things that, that need to be written. Again, can be done through automation, but is more complex. But it really allows you to understand what's the commonality between those things and where is the real work going to be done. And then, of course, once this is done, it pushes out, uh, you know, a, a complete project plan that, that, you know, lets the customer understand, you know, what's going to be done, when it's going to be done, uh, when they need to have resources to do, uh, you know, go beyond the unit test and go in, into, you know, uh, acceptance testing, load testing, all of the rest of those things in that new environment. So there's real clear visibility in terms of, you know, how you're going to get there, the steps, what's required, uh, and the timeline. And, and again, through this process, we've been consistently be able to show people how we can cut these projects down. Uh, by 40, 50, and have actually seen up to 70 and 80 percent of the time, depending on the complexity of the environment they're trying to transfer over. So, very, very powerful, not just from a technology and, and enabling capability, but also enables the decision making behind that uh, so that you can really have a clear visibility into what you have and what it's going to take to get that over there. And now you're starting to take. Uh, things that were written for, you know, uh, IBM Informatica, you know, all of the, the tools that are out there and really, you know, starting to to take advantage of these new technologies, cloud-based ETL, Spark-based, you know, big data initiatives, uh, and do that in a very consistent way because it's machine-generated code, it's done on patterns, it's standardized, uh, it's just, it's, it's an immense amount of uh, time and costs that are saved through that process. And then, you know, I, I know we're getting closer to the end, so uh, I'm going to keep moving along. This is, you know, once the other backside benefit of this is that you're, you've taken this migration through this process, but the thing that enables that process is also the thing that enables governance. So it, governs the process, but it also puts everything in place on day one so that you can really start to govern and, and uh, you know, promote, you know, literacy, fluency, and capability around this new platform, uh, you know, on day one, because the same tools and the same capabilities that you've used to do actually do the migration uh, have left you a, a very robust, rich, and rigorous documentation upon which you can build uh, you know, that governance and intelligence framework uh, that's required. So, you know, what you're looking at here is a capability that we have called the mind map. Um, and that mind map is, can be used on anything, uh, any element of data or, or any, uh, you know, terminology around data that you may have in the business glossary, uh, terms, policies, procedures, or any other custom uh, business assets that you have uh, that you've associated around to bring context to your data. And from that, it queries all of those, uh, all of the metadata, all of the entries into the business glossary, and all of the the entries uh, that are there in that business asset framework, and shows you the connections uh, in a very easily navigable uh, diagram that you can then start to navigate and drill down and start your journey. 
right? So this is available to you just by the fact that you've documented all of this stuff through that migration po uh, process and then leverage some technologies to put business context on top of that. Now you've got a capability where somebody can come in here and look at customers and look at the business terms, uh, look at the business policies, but also drive uh, on the left side into the actual physical technical data assets uh, and then look at, you know, things like, you know, uh, the restriction behind them, you know, is there PII or sensitive data associated with it? All of that becomes clearly available and, and for people to use and understand and start to navigate uh, their journey uh, through the corporate data to, 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 to become a better data citizen. And again, leveraging AI to automate uh, the connection and association of this framework. Uh, really speeds up that process. So, you know, this example here, what we're looking at is, is you know, taking some terminology uh, that's in the business glossary and having, uh, you know, uh, an AI machine learning process go out and sniff through all of the metadata and then bring up the candidates that are there, rank those candidates based on the things that this, you know, this capability learns through the process. And then, you know, your job is to then say, yes, no, this should be associated. No, that shouldn't be associated. Uh, very, very powerful capability in terms of, of taking the, the manual analysis out of it and really accelerating uh, the ability to put a framework over top of this new platform that's going to be very, very beneficial to your, to your entire business moving forward. Talked a little bit about lineage. Uh, you know, lineage is a challenge. We had a, a survey uh, that we did um, uh, late 2019, came out in early 2020, uh, and lineage still becomes, or still sits to the to the top, along with uh, you know uh, trying to reduce data preparation times, with one of the biggest challenges that are out there for organizations of all sizes and all stripes. Uh, and the reason behind that is because it's a complex b lineage is is different is a different thing to different people in the organization and lineage needs to be consumed in different ways by those people because you know a business person may need a specific view they don't need all the technical noise an architect or somebody uh, you know developing uh, you know new data movement processes needs to have uh, a significant amount of detail behind that to be effective uh, so again by documenting all of these things in those mappings, now uh, you can go and query those mappings or the tool in our case, uh, the, the solution queries those mappings and provides you the level of detail that you want uh, and then the ability to navigate and leverage these, these lineages, uh, you know, to, for, for business benefit. You know, a great sample use case is a data steward going out and looking at something that's been classified as, uh, you know, sensitive data, maybe it's PI, maybe it's GDPR, uh, you know, depending on how they've set up that framework of, of, of tagging different and classifying different assets, they can look at the lineage and say, okay, it's, it's tagged as PII in the data warehouse, um, but, you know, it, does that go all the way back to the source system or does that move forward into the business intelligence systems that, uh, that we've also documented in this environment uh, so that everyone has full awareness and we make sure that all of the things that, that, you know, privacy and security that go along with that are following it through the journey. You can actually leverage lineage to then say, you know, go back on the reverse lineage or forward and update all of the, the you know, attributes that are feeding this uh, with that same classification. So again, you know, saving a lot of time and effort and analysis and pain and the potential to miss things using the technology again, because you've started by documenting it in the right place to enable your migration. Now you're, you're driving, you know, you're driving that forward into governance. So, you know, talking about classifications and, you know, the ability to, for people to look at those things and, and, and see, you know, where the classification or sensitive data is across their organization and then using this as the ability to drill down and start to work with that effectively. So, I think we're, we're coming up on, on 10 minutes. So, you know, when we look at this, 
you know, I've mentioned smart connectors. This is a technology that we've generated uh, that is really focused on, on, you know, these four key areas, which is, you know, uh, reverse engineering to auto document, uh, forward engineer to generate code, uh, to integrate ecosystems together in a meaningful way and pass uh, information back, uh, you know, connect to to uh, other automation environments around testing and things like that, so that you know you can you can be part of the bigger picture. Um, and we have smart connectors for all of these technologies uh, and many many more. Uh, there hasn't been, I think, a, a, a data movement environment that we haven't been able to work with that we've been asked for, other than maybe ab initio. So I haven't looked in the questions to see if ab initio is there. If ab initio is there, you're you're <laughs> just like with everything else with that, you're, you might be in a little trouble. But uh, we can we can definitely still help. But it's these smart connectors that give you that capability. And a smart connector, just so that you understand, is not just a single smart connector for a specific vendor or technology. It is a smart connector that becomes the foundation of of you know some some customization and configuration that becomes specific to your environment. Uh, to your needs. So uh, very, very powerful uh, supporting and really allows you to get your arms around that sort of data movement, uh, you know, uh, you know, data in transit, if you will, um, that that has always been such a challenge for all of us uh, in this organization. Again, I remember back when I was building data warehouses back in the old, old days, uh, you know, the biggest problem was always how does you get things to move from one place to another? Uh, what happens to it on the way? How do you change that uh, with integrity? And then how do you, you know, articulate that to the people at the level that they need to understand it uh, to answer their questions that you constantly get asked uh, as, as, as time goes on? So, you know, just to, to, to sort of bring it all together in a, in a nutshell, uh, it's really a, a set of capabilities that you need around these platforms to get the most value out of them and to get to that value uh, to the finish line or the start line, really, when you think about it, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, and you need this combination, you know, this modeling, governance, intelligence, transformation, automation, cataloging, all these things together, uh, you know, with a lot of, of uh, you know, capability to manage that metadata, leverage the metadata, for benefits across the entire scope of the business and the ability to really easily take that and transform that into meaningful messages to all of the stakeholders across the organization so that they can come forward in a self-service way and become more fluent, more literate in the data, more effective in using it for business benefit, and, and at the end of the day, become much better uh, data citizens. So Shannon, I think with that, I think we can move to questions. I'm not sure why I have discussion on the end, but uh, me and you can discuss, Shannon. <laughs> we could. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I may not have much to add, but. Um, <laughs> well, but Danny, thank you so much for this great presentation as always. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of this uh, session. So, uh, Danny, diving in here, how is business continuity being defined when the business is not aware of greater capabilities? Sorry, I, I missed the last part of the, the, the question. It just broke up on mine. Sure. Yeah, but, how is business continuity being defined when the business is not aware of greater capabilities? Well, you know, business continuity to, to to me is is you know at, at least the abilities not to stop <laughs> or not to be forced to stop. So when I talk about business continuity, it's really about you know making sure that when something like COVID comes along and everybody has to go home, that you know we don't just put the shutters up and 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 stop that, right? But then business continuity goes to the next level, which is. You know, we have, a, you know, a, a community in our organization that's relying on our existing data warehouse in order to do things from an operational perspective, from a strategic perspective, a decision-making perspective. Um, and, you know, if we're going to go to some new capabilities, 
um, you know, they don't want to know about it because they want to be able to still get what they need um, and, 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 you know, without being told, sorry, you're going to have to shut down for a period of time because we're moving over to, to this side. Where I think it really starts uh, to, to get exciting for, for those folks that aren't aware of the new capabilities is when they see the response to, to their new requirements and their requests coming in for, for different things that they need to, to be successful in their job. So, you know, it, I think in a, in a perfect world, you know, part of business continuity is to provide a, a, a superior capability to your business without having to, you know, really tell them too much about it other than the fact of, you know, these are the benefits, this is how much it's going to cost, and, and this is when we can have it for you, because that's truly business, you know, continuity. Uh, you know, I remember in the old days trying to, you know, make a simple change in, in, in the data warehouse and, uh, you know, you would tell them, you know, the, the period of time and a look on their face would, would be shocking. You know, the beauty of these new technologies and some of the new approaches that are out there, you know, things like data, well, data vault's not new, but it's, it's, it's I think, being refined and becoming, uh, you know, much more popular and, and seen as a, uh, a route to agile, uh, you know, uh, data aggregation and data warehousing, you know, it, it's really about the business response that they get. And if you're doing your job right, other than the folks that hold the budget, you know, the people that are using the facilities that you build for them from a data perspective, uh, the only realization that they should have that something's changed um, is, is that things are getting better. They're getting what they want faster. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, they're using some new tools and technologies to do that. Those tools and technologies should be more intuitive and more easier for them to understand. So again, nothing that's going to be a burden for them. You really want to be able to, to deliver this, you know, almost sight unseen uh, to the person who, who's average out there. And they're just feeling that life for them is getting better, easier, uh, and, and allowing them to be much more effective. I hope that answers the question. But um, Yeah, certainly. So, Danny, um, uh, a couple slides back on uh, on your smart connector slide. Uh, what about uh, FME for for uh, for GIS data for ge geographic information data? Again, you know, we our connectors are are really working at a, a, a sort of metadata level, but you know, that, that type of data is in a system and, and, you know, and that system is probably, you know, has some, some unique qualities around it for it to be able to do those things. So, um, you know, not being, uh, you know, an expert around that space, again, I, I'll kind of repeat uh, what I've, you know, uh, you know, what, what I found in, in, in moving forward with this. Uh, our 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 lead in this world, who is a, just a genius and a and a and a real real good guy, John Carter, he has not uh, you know sort of met a use case um, uh, or a, a a a sort of been able to not been able to deliver a capability in terms of bringing things together uh, and leveraging those things to either move them or to automate them through the process. So, um, you know, what I would say about that is, you know, this is a route to do that just as it's been a route to do a lot of other things. Uh, I would just advise people come, you know, reach out. We're very, very friendly. Uh, and let, let's have a talk about it because uh, I haven't seen something that where we've done that yet. But again, I haven't seen something that, that has come in that we haven't been able to do for the customer other than maybe ab initio from an ETL. And if anyone's out there from Ab issue, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, this approach is very reusable uh, across, you know, different things. It started out as simple ETL tool to ETL tool, then it started, you know, moved into BI worlds, and then it started moving into you know, the big data world. And uh, every challenge that we've seen come in front of us, uh, we've been able to overcome that and deliver you know what the customer wanted so uh i i would i would say you know reach out and let's uh let's talk because i think you'd be excited to see uh, what the capabilities really could be so 
Dana, we just really have a minute left, but I want to see if I can, we could probably spend a, a whole webinar on this next question, but see if you have an elevator pitch. Um, <laughs> to, um, <laughs> what are the best practices to avoid overspend on migration to cloud platforms and how do we avoid those pitfalls? Well, I, you know, the best practices that I've seen organizations, you know, the ones that have been successful um, is, you know, uh, make sure that you, you, you start with a manageable scope. Uh, so, you know, some people want to take everything they have and just drop it onto the platform and say, let's go. Um, and, and generally that doesn't, I won't say it doesn't work because again, depending on the complexity and the, the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the size of what they're trying to move, you know, they may be able to do that because they're small enough to do that. But what we've seen is, is most people are, are looking for a specific new capability on the cloud. So whether it's, uh, you know, implementing a data lake that they may not have had before uh, or migrating a data lake that they may have put onto, you know, uh, Hadoop on premise or something like that. And then looking at the cloud uh, to be able to do that. Uh, because what we found is, is as you move things across to these platforms, there's a lot of reuse in that process. So there's, a, you know, a little bit of learning and a lot of reuse. So, you know, start with something that's impactful enough uh, that, that you're going to be able to measure the benefits, but not too big that you're going to bog yourself down uh, and, and really just, you know, you know get, get sort of funded, you know, swamped under by volume. Uh, and then, you know, leverage that and, you know, create that repeatable process that you can start to bring. So, you know, take your data warehouse across uh, or your data lake. Um, and then, you know, start to patriate, uh, you know, different applications that make sense and, you know, over a period of time, but incremental proof of success uh, and then repeat success, I think, is, is as close to best practices as I can deliver. That's perfect. Well, Danny, again, thank you so much as always. Another great presentation. And thanks to our attendees and being so engaged in everything we do. But that is all the time we have for today. Again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. So I hope everyone has a great day and stay safe out there. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, everybody.